All right, thanks very much, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here, of course, uh, as always. And, um, and as Gary's going to be telling you uh, about the quantum field theory, um, and uh, uh, roughly speaking, uh, the talk will have uh, two parts. Uh, the first one will be quite <coughs> elementary and, and hopefully introductory, uh, so that we're all on the same page. Uh, although, of course, the selection of topics will be somewhat idiosyncratic, because I've, I've chosen them to prepare you for the second part, which will be uh, slightly more advanced and, and in contact with um, you know, more recent developments. Um, so uh, let's start very basic, uh, some comments on classical mechanics. And uh, intuitively, you might think that um, you have a visceral understanding of how to count degrees of freedom in classical mechanics. If you have a system of n particles, uh, you might think that, roughly speaking, it should have n degrees of freedom. And here, it's very important that, you know, this notation, DOF, it will appear on almost every slide multiple, multiple times. Uh, it, it always stands for degrees of freedom. Okay? And uh, more we can be more precise about what we, what we mean by counting degrees of freedom in classical mechanics. Namely, the state of a classical system at any fixed time is, is specified by giving the n position vectors and the n momentum vectors of the particles. And together, that data comprises the classical phase space, and at least in three spatial dimensions, that's a 6n dimensional space. So we can say that there's 6n degrees of freedom rather than n, but okay, that, that's still pretty close to what, what our intuition told us. And uh, you know, more generally, every classical dynamical system has a phase space, and its dimension is a pretty good notion of what we mean by the number of degrees of freedom. And as you can already see from the description I'm giving, this way of counting degrees of freedom is essentially kinematical. Right? It depends on concepts like phase space, but at no point have I mentioned the Hamiltonian, and so, so the dynamics doesn't feature prominently in this way of counting. Now, in quantum mechanics, uh, some things are different, but uh, otherwise uh, uh, pretty similar. Uh, if you consider a system of n particles in quantum mechanics, um, we now describe it using a wave function that will depend on, say, uh, n position vectors, n coordinate vectors, and the position basis. And so now the wave function has three n arguments, again, staying in standard three-dimensional space. Um, and in fact, the number of arguments of the wave function is the same in any basis you choose for the Hilbert space. So for example, if you Fourier transform and go to the momentum basis, the wave function will still have three n arguments, and this will always be the same in any basis, and therefore it's a meaningful and well-defined concept to ask how many arguments does the wave function depend on. Um, for example, uh, we, can, we can look at a spin chain, which is rather different than, than the system of n particles. So if we have a spin chain with n sites, the wave function now also depends on n arguments, but the arguments will be, say, the z projections of the individual spins in the chain. And so uh, these examples kind of give you a sense that counting the number of arguments that the wave function has is a pretty useful number way, way of counting the number of degrees of freedom. And uh, just by the way that these examples pan out, you see that it's pretty similar to the way things worked in classical mechanics. In fact, it's, the correspondence is very sharp because, uh, because the number of arguments of the wave function is always half of the dimension of the classical phase space if you are quantizing uh, a system that has a classical um, kind of progenitor. And there's a good reason for that, but, but that will not be important for this talk. OK, so uh, we, we discussed so far. Uh, sorry, can I ask a question? But the, the number of arguments is kind of crude because those arguments, for instance, for spin versus a, you know, a, a particle moving on the line, you know, the, dimension, the associated dimension of the Hilbert space could be very different. Is it really appropriate to just count the number of arguments? Well, so indeed, you, you might say that another, perhaps another way of counting the number of degrees of freedom, a very different way, would be to look at the dimension of the Hilbert space. So then that would be the analog of the volume of the classical phase space. That's a vastly different notion. For example, as you already implied, that, that would always be infinite for particles moving in non-compact space, and it would be finite for, for, say, a finite spin chain. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the type of notion that I'm going after here is, is more the one that's like the dimension of the classical phase space. Okay. Yeah. But of course, I mean, there's a whole zoo of different, different measures which all have their merits, and there are others based on <coughs> more sophisticated topics like entanglement and so forth that we'll get to later. Um, but uh, 
I'm mostly setting up this very intuitive notion uh, of degree of freedom counting now, so I can tear it down with gusto in a little bit. So, so, so don't take it too seriously yeah. now, as you're saying. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so far, uh, you know, we've sort of implied that we're discussing systems of a few particles or a few spins, but um, of course, uh, most or many interesting systems in nature have uh, zillions of constituents. Here, are two pretty nice uh, and kind of tongue-in-cheek examples. Of course, a pot of boiling water has roughly Avogadro's number worth of, of uh, constituents, and the whole universe has a whole lot more constituents. Um, and so these are typical many-particle systems that we're interested in, many-body systems. And um, as, as uh, many of you will know, uh, relativistic quantum field theories, like the standard model of, of elementary particle physics, uh, can and, and perhaps should also be thought of <coughs> as examples of such many-body systems with many, many degrees of freedom. Okay. And when we discuss um, the long-distance behavior, of such many body systems, um, it's typically much better to describe them using a few smooth functions rather than the many, many individual <coughs> particle positions. Okay? And passing from that description in terms of the point particles to the description in terms of smooth functions, even classically, uh, it involves taking a continuum limit. Okay? So let me uh, walk you a little bit through the picture on the right. Um, the picture on the right is meant, meant to be some sort of discrete lattice. Uh, approximation to a, kind of a one-dimensional <coughs> string, like say a violin string. So these are point particles that, that make some shape like this, and at this stage there are n of them, and we can give their x and y coordinates, uh, and uh, maybe there's some notion of a lattice spacing that tells you how far on the string they sit apart. So as we make the lattice spacing finer and make n bigger, mm -hmm. add more and more particles, uh, this discrete system will better and better approximate uh, a continuous medium like the strip. And in the formal limit where we take the number of constituents to infinity and, and the lattice spacing to zero, we get a kind of perfect description in terms of a smooth function uh, where the transverse displacement of the string is a smooth function of the, the x-coordinate along, along this direction. So this is what we mean by a continuum limit. This is very standard. This is, for example, how uh, going through such a procedure and applying Newton's laws to the microscopic system here uh, for example, gives you the, the derivation of the wave equation for the, for the string. Uh, the one important point I want to make, and this point will be coming up over and over throughout the talk, is that as you take the continuum limit, some details about the microscopic system that you started with are washed out. And that's not surprising. For example, if you put some little kink in, this, in, the, in the particle uh, arrangement here, you know, if one of the particles sticks out a little funny, then as you take the continuum limit, that won't matter very much. That will not affect the the continuous distribution that you get at the end. And another classic example that, that we're familiar with from kind of our early days in physics is, uh, is that when we talk about fluids, uh, it's much more useful to describe them using a, a velocity field, which is a smooth function, more or less smooth function of position, rather than trying to keep track of the position of individual molecules. OK. So as I've already uh, emphasized in the previous slide, the continuum <coughs> limit involves taking the number n of degrees of freedom to infinity, and therefore that naive notion of, of degrees of freedom counting that, that I started with diverges in the continuum limit. And, and this is one version of what's known as the UV catastrophe, the ultraviolet catastrophe in classical physics. Right? Each, each degree of freedom contributes, for instance, a constant amount to say the specific heat capacity. If we, if we take the string example as a toy model of a solid, each, each little atom is roughly speaking a harmonic oscillator, and by the classical equipartition theorem, each, each degree of freedom contributes roughly one unit to the specific heat, and so that will diverge in the continuum limit, in the strict continuum limit. And of course, in a real material, uh, the number of atoms or, or molecules will always be finite, and there's always some type of short distance cut, cut off implied, so that lo underlying lattice is, is physical, uh, on, on the other hand, there are other kinds of theories that we, that we are very familiar with uh, that are classical continuum theories, like Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, where the underlying cutoff is far from obvious if you just look at the classical theory. Um, and it is, in, in fact, possible to kind of define a, a lattice version of Maxwell's theory that has finite n and regulates the infinity 
Um, but now you've kind of modified the theory, and, and uh, all the observables might actually depend on how, uh, how you did that modification. And, and uh, you know, in that example, it's not so clear whether um, the details of the short distance cutoff scheme are, are uh, physical, like in the solid, or they're just an artifact of how you cut off the divergence. OK. So uh, in this way of thinking about things where, you, where uh, quanti uh, kind of continuum field theories are limits of discrete systems, the, the quantization is very straightforward. Because uh, if you quantize before you take the continuum limit, everything is just ordinary quantum mechanics. Uh, so from that point of view, quantum field theory is not all that more complicated than uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, but again, if you, if you first have to regularize and go to the discrete system, then just as in the classical theory, all the observables can, in principle, depend on the cutoff that we used to regularize the, the continuum limit. And even though I won't go through any of the details of how this is done, um, quantum field theory provides a, a consistent framework for how you extract meaningful uh, continuum physics uh, that is largely independent of how, how you did the, uh, the UV cutoff procedure. And the intuitive idea behind this, and the intuitive and very physical idea behind this, is that somehow you should just focus on the long distance degrees of freedom that will end up being important in the continuum limit, like, the, like these smooth functions that I was talking about, uh, rather than the, all the short distance degrees of freedom that live uh, near the cutoff. And so this is a very basic instance of, of a very general idea called scaling, where you somehow separate the, the uh, different physical degrees of freedom by, by scaling, you try to sort of <coughs> go to the long distance limit. And I'll be much more precise about this in, in a few slides. Um, now, quantizing Maxwell theory famously removes the UV catastrophe for the heat capacity, uh, that particular observable. That's what Planck did. That was the uh, beginning, uh, the very beginning of quantum mechanics, and simultaneously, really, the beginning of quantum field theory in, in one go. Um, and of course, quantizing the Maxwell field also leads to a new elementary particle or excitation, namely the photon. And that's, that's what Einstein <coughs> added. Um, and the exact details of how the quantized Maxwell theory were only worked out much later in the 1930s. Um, and it's really the first example of a, of a relativistic, uh, which is to say a Lorentz invariant quantum field theory. Uh, and of course, now, by now we know many other examples, including the standard model of elementary particle physics. And in, in such relativistic theories that whose, whose goal is to describe particle physics, the, um, the underlying medium or material that I used to motivate the short distance cutoff is not obvious. I mean, you might be tempted to introduce a lattice at intermediate stages of the calculation, but it's not clear why, why that should be viewed as fundamental. And um, one useful notion to keep in the back of your head is that in relativistic theories, the vacuum itself can often be usefully thought of as the underlying medium. So that's. That's a little bit uh, highbrow. Um, we'll get back to some more concrete stuff. Um, so the basic observables, some, some of the basic observables that you talk about in continuum quantum field theory uh, are just expectation values of local quantum fields. Um, and you know, in quantum field theory, the, the quantum fields now have become operators. And you can sensibly ask what their quantum mechanical expectation values look like. And roughly speaking, uh, Two-point expectation values like this one uh, probe the propagation of the, the excitations or the particles described by the field phi. So this represents, roughly speaking, propagation from point x to point y. And three or higher point functions of the field phi probe interactions and scattering between those quanta. So for example, a three-point correlator, roughly speaking, probes the three-point scattering amplitude of these excitations. Same for four and higher points. So um, in fact, by looking at these types of correlators for more and more phi's, we can extract the full scattering data and the full, full S matrix for the particle-like excitations that, that are described by the field phi. Now, instead of looking at correlation functions of more and more phi's, there's another useful way of probing the dynamics of the theory and describing these excitations, which is to uh, couple the field phi to a classical background field. So this j of x is a classical function that acts as a source for the quantum field phi. Right? It, turning it on creates phi quanta. And uh, then what you can do is you can look at the, uh, the fully nonlinear response of the phi field to the turning on of that source. 
So this is the expectation value of the phi operator in the presence of the source j. And that then includes all the correlation functions of the phi's without the source. Roughly speaking, the intuition is that the source, you know, by, by uh, you know, being time and position dependent, can create this phi quantum and these two phi quanta. Uh, and so turning on the source is almost the same as, as, uh, as adding these quanta by hand. So, so far everything I've said um, has been very general and uh, indeed quantum field theory describes a huge number of very diverse physical phenomena. So here are some, some examples uh, and that, that I would just like to briefly go through. So for example, we are, uh, I already discussed the fact that we can extract uh, data about scattering amplitudes from quantum field theory and in the top left corner here you have a complicated uh, scattering event at the Large Hadron Collider particle accelerator uh, that discovered the Higgs boson, and uh, you know this is a complicated mess. Uh, but uh, but quantum field theory and the Sander model in particular is very very good at predicting what this mess looks like. Um, another you know, great example uh, of what quantum field theory can do is uh, describe uh, theories of electron fractionalization in, in two dimensional systems. So here's a cartoon of the I guess the Laughlin state in fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, so here, this is supposed to be an electron that fractionalizes into three quasi-particles. Um, very interesting, rich, strongly interacting, uh, many-body system. Uh, up here is the phase diagram of water, and uh, through uh, heat, uh, the the water enough, and then you go to the special point in the phase diagram for the, the critical point. Uh, then uh, you'll find a nice, interesting quantum field theory that describes the behavior of the, the fluid in the vicinity of that point. And Question? Yes, please. Is it necessary to invoke quantum mechanics to understand the phase diagram of water? No, uh, but uh, there's an interesting and exact correspondence between quantum field theories in uh, 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 D dimensions and classical statistical systems in D plus one dimensions. So uh, you can think of the classical statistical mechanics of water in three spatial dimensions uh, as a two plus one dimensional quantum field theory. And that's the sense in which, uh, in which this describes that phase diagram, or at least the vicinity of that point. Um, down here we have confinement in, in QCD in uh, uh, four dimensional uh, gauge theory, right? This is supposed to be an up quark and a and the down quark that are tethered together by a kind of collimated flux tube um, that, that binds them together. So this is a strongly coupled quantum field theory that describes the hadronic world. And uh, the picture here in the middle is a pushing my luck a bit because, of course, you know that black holes are gravitational objects that are described by, by gravity, classical, and quantum gravity. And in general, quantum field theory is not sufficient to describe their properties, not by a long shot. Uh, but uh, there are special kind of lucky or favorable situations in which some properties of black holes can be uh, analyzed by mapping uh, the, the problem that you ask on the black hole side to a different but equivalent problem in, in, a, in a quantum field theory. So I'll very briefly comment on that later. And so these examples really show uh, to what extent QFT is a unified language that describes uh, many, many areas of physics. Um, now, uh, one very important concept that will feature throughout the second half of the talk is that of a renormalization <coughs> group flow. And we've already encountered the intuitive idea that, that we should disentangle the degrees of freedom at long and short distances. And this is really what the renormalization group, or, or RG, does for you. It, in, it, it organizes the dynamics of the entire theory by scale. And, and this is a hugely powerful idea that is usually associated with the name of Ken Wilson. Uh, although many, many people made contributions to that. And um, from now on, uh, I will kind of implicitly be uh, using the terminology that is appropriate for discussing Lorentz invariant relativistic quantum field theories. And in those theories, it's often uh, you know, more standard to use energy rather than distance in order to indicate scale. So here the energy will be denoted by E, and there will be a, a high energy cutoff lambda, which is inversely related to the lattice cutoff. That, that we were using in position space uh, in the beginning of the talk. But I will kind of be smoothly 
uh, switching back and forth between the, the energy and the distance uh, way of talking about things. Um, right. And now the, the name or normalization group is, is essentially historical, and I will not explain where that comes from, but, but this, is what, this is what it means. And the dynamics of a quantum field theory traces a flow, so-called random normalization group flow, from the ultraviolet or short distances to the infrared at long distances. So this is a cartoon picture of a random normalization group flow. You start at high energies at the cutoff scale, and at that scale, the system might look like a lattice or some other discrete system that we started with. And then you follow the dynamics, you know, kind of you organize the dynamics by scale, and you trace it from short to long distances. And once you arrive at very long distances at approximately zero energy, only massless or gapless excitations survive. And all the massive <coughs> gap excitations that were present at intermediate energies or at very high energies uh, do not affect the long distance dynamics. And this is an important phenomenon known as decoupling. And uh, the, the main point of decoupling is that at the end of the day, there are fewer relevant physical degrees of freedom in the deep IR than you started out with in the UV. Now, the degrees of freedom with zero energy uh, have an interesting emergent symmetry, uh, which is scale invariance, roughly speaking, because uh, zero doesn't have any units. Um, that, that, that's cutting it a bit short. Um, and uh, this emergent scale invariance near zero energy uh, is uh, associated with what's called the randomization group fixed point, because if you follow this flow, then once you uh, approach zero energy, you, know, you kind of stay there forever. Uh, and under favorable conditions, this emergent scale symmetry is further enhanced to what's known as the full conformal group, or the full conformal symmetry, which is the group SOD, 2. And, uh, and Joe Polsinski here has uh, clarified in various important ways when this enhancement from scale invariance to conformal symmetry actually happens. And what that means is that the IR fixed point is not only scale invariant, but in a full-fledged conformal field theory. And just a brief comment that, that will not play a huge role later in the talk is that uh, you know here I've emphasized everywhere the, the, the lattice cutoff, the underlying short distance cutoff, but it is actually sometimes possible to take that cutoff to infinity uh, and I get a continuum theory at all scales, but this requires a second fixed point of the randomization group in the deep UV that controls the short distance behavior. Uh, So this was the first part of the talk. And let me summarize briefly what I've said so far. So the first, the first message was that in quantum field theory, various intuitive ways of counting degrees of freedom always include some unwanted effects from very short distances near the, near the cutoff or the lattice or whatever you use to define the theory in the first place. And, and very often, they dominate this naive degree of freedom count, and uh, they can even make it infinite. And so all of this basically just means that these ways of thinking about degrees of freedom counting were not useful ways. Perhaps intuitive, but not, not useful. The second thing that we learned from the randomization group is that uh, we should focus on the effect of low energy or long distance degrees of freedom that, that are important at, at very long macroscopic distances. And, and the third statement in that context was that the effective number of physically relevant degree of freedom, whatever that means, should in some sense decrease along where normalization group flows from short to long distances. So this last statement is a little bit imprecise. It's, uh, it's not a very sharp statement. It's kind of a physical principle or, or a piece of intuition. Uh, and we will soon make it more precise um, in the second part of the talk. So part two is how to count degrees of freedom in quantum field theory. That was really what I promised you in the title. And uh, as I said, the first part was mainly, among other things, supposed to convince you that, that this is uh, not a totally obvious uh, thing to do. And what I'll try to do in the second part is give you a brief sense of how one can do better. And this will actually rather quickly take us into, uh, into kind of current research territory and, and it'll also give me an opportunity to mention a few things that I've worked on. Okay, 
So let me introduce the notion of a C function. So the idea is that we would like to make our whole discussion about counting degrees of freedom more precise by introducing some kind of counting function. So let me call this counting function oops, a C function. OK, second try. There we go. Uh, so C here uh, stands for counting. That's not the historical origin of the name C, but I think it's a better, better reason for calling it a C function. Um, and based on the sort of very general lessons that we learned in part one, we might ask what are the useful, uh, what properties should a useful C function have? What, what are the kind of properties we expect it to have? Just sort of on, on very general grounds before we get into the details. Um, so the primary property it should have is, is it should be well-defined. It should be a number and it should be finite. It should avoid this <coughs> UV catastrophe type of problem that we encountered in, in the uh, uh, naive setting. Um, it should be dimensionless. <coughs> because otherwise it's not a number. Um, you can rescale it and make it anything you want. Uh, and you might think that because it's supposed to count something, it should also be quantized in some sense. Uh, that's what certainly the, the naive uh, analogy with counting would suggest. But in fact, it turns out that that's a bit too strong. It's, it's in fact too strong to demand that the C, C function should be quantized. So we will not demand that. Um, and finally, we would like it to be positive, at least in unitary theories. Right? I'm always assuming unitarity throughout the talk. Uh, and uh, and you know, we, any useful notion of counting degrees of freedom should mean that you, know, you can only add to that count. You can't take away from it. It shouldn't be stuff that counts negatively. Now, the whole, uh, right, so let me just make one comment here. Right? So that C should be positive, but, but it might be 0. And uh, I'll briefly comment on theories that have very few or almost no degrees of freedom, but are not completely trivial, where, where C is 0, but, uh, but they're not, that are not the empty theory. Um, now, from the whole randomization group discussion, we've also learned that C is not a number. It's not one number. It's actually a function that depends on the length scale at which you examine the system. Right? We've seen that the number of degrees of freedom should vary as you go from short to long distances. So we expect that C is a function of length scale L, and that the derivative with respect to L, as you go from short to long distances, is negative. This means that C is decreasing as you scale towards the infrared. Okay? And as a consequence of this statement, just by integrating it between the UV and the IR fixed point, you get this weaker inequality, which says that C of the UV theory should be strictly bigger than C of the IR theory if you have a non-trivial randomization group flow. Okay? And um, statements like this one in bullet point two or this one in bullet point three are often called C theorems. This terminology is very loose. In particular, the word C theorem is used even when there is no actual proof of the conjectured statement. So this is unfortunate, but, but it's useful to bear it in mind. And what these inequalities are supposed to do is quantify the intuitive notion that the number of degrees of freedom decreases towards the IR, that the heavy degrees of freedom decouple. So this is supposed to be a precise version of that. OK, so let me discuss the C theorem in two dimensions. Uh, in two space-time dimensions, uh, Sasha Zamolodzikov was the first person to <coughs> construct an example of a C function. And what he did is he used two-point correlation functions of the stress-energy tensor T mu nu. And so in particular, use the energy density, which is just the 0, 0 time, time component of the stress tensor. And so he looked at the two-point function of the energy density. And there were some correction terms that he had to add for technical reasons, which involve other components of T. I will kind of sweep these under the rug, mostly focus on this one. Uh, the energy density in two space-time dimensions has units of 1 over <coughs> length squared. So this thing has units of 1 over length to the fourth. So if you multiply it by L to the fourth, you get a nice dimensionless object. And this is uh, the candidate C function that he wrote down uh, after including these corrections. And he proved that the first derivative of this candidate C function is indeed negative using only very, very general principles of quantum field theory, like, uh, for example, energy conservation, uh, which in this context is just the statement that the stress tensor is conserved, the conserved current associated with translations and, and uh, rotations. Uh, he used Lorentz invariance, and he crucially used unitarity. So this is a very general 
fact about 2D theories that follows very simply from very general principles. One thing you can see from this equation is that if, if C happens to be zero, then this two-point function of the energy density is zero. And a two-point function uh, of some uh, operator is only zero if the operator is, itself is zero. That's something that follows from unitarity, roughly speaking, because a two-point function is like a norm squared. Um, so, so what this shows is that the C function is always non-negative, um, and it can only be zero if the energy density itself is the zero operator. And that, that is only possible in theories that are, that are topological, that don't have any local, <coughs> local degrees of freedom that carry energy density, but that might have some kind of global degrees of freedom that extend over all of space-time. Good. Um, now, just on a kind of intuitive note, the fact that the stress tensor somehow plays a role in constructing a C function that counts degrees of freedom is not so surprising, since essentially all local degrees of freedom are expected to carry some type of energy. OK. So what I would like to do in the next two slides is give two kind of um, related or alternative interpretations of the C function that Zamologikov constructed. And those two alternative interpretations will be useful for us going forward and discussing uh, what one should do in other space-time dimensions. So the first thing that I would like to do um, is to, to explain the relation of, of, of the C function to the trace anomaly. Uh, so at conformal fixed points, Scale invariance implies that the C function on the previous slide it cannot depend on L. It's actually just a constant number. Um, and it turns out to be related or pro proportional to the so-called Verisor central charge. And I won't explain in detail what that is, but it's a standard quantity in two-dimensional conformal field theory. Uh, and in fact, this is the historical origin of the name C function. It started its life as the Verisor central charge, which happens to be conventionally called C. And this quantity depends, uh, determines many, many other useful physical quantities in the CFT. For example, uh, the uh, Verisor central charge also determines the thermal free energy of a CFT. And you might think, uh, since, we, since we are now on the subject, that the thermal free energy is also a pretty good uh, you know, intuitive candidate for counting degrees of freedom in a, in a quantum field theory. That's something you might have tried. Uh, and indeed, you see in two dimensions, it agrees with this other uh, Verisor central charge definition. But it turns out that in higher dimensions, this uh, kind of intuition breaks down. And in fact, there, there are known examples, carefully studied examples in more than two space-time dimensions, where the uh, thermal free energy is not an acceptable C function. <coughs> that is to say, it doesn't satisfy all of the, the axioms or, or general properties that I, I listed in a couple of slides ago. So even though it's intuitive and perhaps more refined than this very naive degree of freedom counting that I introduced in the beginning of the talk, it's still not an acceptable C function which goes to show you that even though we have a very intuitive idea of what degrees of freedom means, uh, it's not so easy to come up with an actual C function. Now, uh, in this context, it's interesting to think about the response of the stress tensor to its classical source. This was a concept that I introduced a little bit uh, in, in part one. If you have a quantum field or an operator, uh, one way to probe it is to uh, turn on a classical source that couples to it. And the appropriate classical source that couples to the stress tensor is unsurprisingly a metric. Uh, that's how it works in general relativity, where the metric is dynamical. Here, the metric is not dynamical. It's just a background field. It's a classical source that we tune, you know, eh, say, in the lab to study the response of the stress tensor. And this might seem a bit academic, because you know, it's not clear what you might mean by tuning the metric in the lab. But if you have an actual material, you can you know, subjected to various stresses and shears and so forth and simulate the effects uh, of a background metric. So, so this is practically doable. And, uh, you know, the response of the stress tensor to the metric is very complicated and encodes lo lots and lots of information about the theory, including all the correlation functions of the stress tensor. There's kind of one part of it that's very simple and very interesting, and that's the response uh, function of the trace of the stress tensor. Right? And, and that turns out to have an incredibly simple form. <coughs> so the response function of the trace is just proportional to the Verisor central charge times the Ricci curvature, the Ricci scalar of the background metric. And remember that we're in 2D, so 
Ritchie scalar is the only independent curvature invariant. Uh, and so this is a non-zero uh, uh, expectation value. And that's surprising, because um, we're discussing a conformal field theory. And uh, conformal invariance, one way of encoding conformal invariance is saying that the, uh, the stress tensor should be traceless. Um, uh, I, I won't you know, explain that in too much detail, but, but this is one of the many equivalent ways of, uh, of stating what you might mean by conformal invariance. And here we have a situation where the stress tensor is zero in flat space. Right? If you go back to a flat metric, the right-hand side vanishes. But it is, in fact, non-zero in a general curve background. And that is a situation where you have a, a symmetry of a flat space quantum field theory, namely conformal symmetry, that is broken by the turning on the corresponding source. And that's the sort of hallmark of, of what's called an anomaly in quantum field theory. Okay? Conformal symmetry is broken in curved space, even though it's present in flat space. And, um, and I will not explain in detail how anomalies work either, except to say that they're very, very common in quantum field theory. And their study is a, a rich and, and interesting subject. And uh, roughly speaking, the way that one can view an anomaly is um, that it's some effect that arises from, from the fact that back in the deep back of our minds, we, we defined the theory using a short distance cutoff. Um, and we thought that most of that cutoff disappeared when we went to the continuum limit. But the anomaly is a, is a remnant that doesn't completely decouple. So it's a very interesting effect. So, the lesson from this slide is that the Virasoro central charge, which was the C function in a 2D CFT, is also the same as this coefficient that appears in the trace anomaly. That's interpretation number one. Interpretation number two is the relation to vacuum entanglement. So let me remind you in one sentence uh, how uh, very basic notions of entanglement work. Um, if you start with uh, some pure state, psi, in a factorized Hilbert space of this form that factorizes into two tensor factors, h sub a and h sub b, that you can think of as corresponding to uh, different subsystems of the full quantum system, then you can construct what's called a reduced density matrix of the state psi, where you, uh, you take the outer product of psi with itself, and then you trace over the uh, sub-Hilbert space h sub a. And this reduced density matrix characterizes the quantum mechanical entanglement between the subsystems A and B in the state Psi. So rho is a very useful quantity. And the von Neumann entropy, the standard von Neumann entropy of rho, which is this minus trace rho log rho, is what's called the entanglement entropy of, uh, of this partition in this state. So this is a useful measure of quantum entanglement. <coughs> and Let's see how uh, this works out in two-dimensional conformal field theory. So in two-dimensional conformal field theory, we can take psi to just be the vacuum state of the quantum field theory. That's a very natural state that's always around. And we are just studying the Hilbert space on a, you know, on a line in flat space. Uh, and then we're going to partition the Hilbert space into two by cutting uh, the line into two subregions. There will be subregion A, which is a, an interval of length L, and then there will be B, which is just the complement of A. And then you can ask, in that context, what is the entanglement entropy of the conformal field theory in the vacuum state once you do this partition of the system? And this was answered a long time ago by Frank Wilczek and, uh, and two of his students. And, uh, and this is the answer. You get an entanglement which is, again, proportional to the Virasoro central charge times the logarithm of the length of the interval. And there's a a lambda here, which is a UV cutoff, um, which, which has all sorts of interesting interpretations. But for, for the purposes of what I'm saying now, all that really matters is that the same Virasoro central charge shows up um, that we've already encountered on the previous two slides. And if you want to go beyond conformal field theories and study non-trivial renormalization group flows, then it turns out that this quantity, the, the, the interval entanglement entropy, is, is a very useful quantity because it actually defines Another C function, a new type of C function, which is different from the one that Zamologikov constructed. And uh, you can use that C function to give a new and different proof of the two-dimensional C theorem, which was done by uh, Cassini and Huerta about 10 years ago, so maybe a little more. And so the second slogan is that uh, the number of degrees of freedom, at least in two dimensions, 
is, a, is encoded in vacuum entanglement. <coughs> it's encoded in the trace anomaly, and it's encoded in vacuum entanglement. OK, so we understand a little bit what's going on in two dimensions, and now we can see what, ha what happens in, in other space-time dimensions, in particular higher space-time dimensions. And uh, there the situation is a, a sort of a little bit different in even and odd dimensions. Uh, it turns out that in all even space-time dimensions, there is always a trace anomaly. There are always trace anomalies. Uh, so you can always study the oops, gravitational response of the stress tensor, in particular of the trace of the stress tensor, to a background metric G. And you will always find on the right-hand side some type of dimensionless coefficient, let's call it little a, times a curvature invariant called the Euler density. The Euler density is some type of curvature invariant that's made up of various contractions of Riemann tensors. And in d dimensions, it's always made up of uh, contractions of d over 2 Riemann tensors. And remember that d is even. So, so it goes like Riemann squared in four dimensions, Riemann cubed in six dimensions, and so forth. And the, the ellipsis here on the right-hand side includes all sorts of other trace anomalies that are gen generically present, but that I won't discuss in detail. And uh, just to see how this fits with the two-dimensional story, in two dimensions, remember that the Euler density was just a Ricci scalar, and what we call A here was just the Virasoro central charge there. And on the basis of this analogy and a few other pieces of evidence, John Carty, uh, almost 30 years ago, when he was a, a professor here, uh, conjectured that this number, the A anomaly, actually satisfies a C theorem in all even dimensions. So he conjectured that that the A of the UV theory should always be bigger than the A of the infrared theory. And in this context, this conjecture is known as an A theorem, which is the A theorem. And uh, this proved to be a very fruitful conjecture that, that stimulated a lot of activity. Uh, but it took a very long time to prove, even in four dimensions, which is the, the first case of <coughs> two where this conjecture applies. It was proven by Komargotsky and Schwimmer quite recently. And in six or more dimensions, it's actually an open problem. And if you are wondering why I'm talking about quantum field theory in six dimensions, you should. Uh, and I will, I will say a few words about that um, at the end of the talk. Uh, by the way, I should also say that among the axioms we had was the, the requirement that the C function should be positive. And so in, but if this conjecture is to hold water, we, we also expect that the A anomaly should be positive uh, in, uh, in all even dimensions. And it turns out that that's, that's a known fact in four dimensions. It was proven by these gentlemen. But it's actually also an unproven and open problem in six or higher dimensions. Now, that was the even dimensional case. In odd dimensions, the situation is very different because there are, in fact, no trace anomalies. So we can't use this analogy with trace anomalies to even get off the ground. But um, since we also had a different interpretation in terms of vacuum entanglement, we can try to build on that. And even though I have absolutely no time to explain how that works, uh, that is actually a very, very successful and fruitful point of view. For example, uh, in three space-time dimensions, again, Cassini and Huerta were able to use uh, vacuum entanglement across a disk-shaped region to construct uh, a viable C function and give a, give a proof of a, of a C theorem there. Uh, and even though that, that proof has kind of still, you know, has gone through various iterations of di di digestions, uh, it seems to hold up and, and, uh, and really be correct and a very very useful way of thinking about C theorems um, in general. So that's the rough overview. Now, we've talked about C theorems, we've talked about counting degrees of freedom, and throughout the talk I've kind of tried to emphasize the conceptual importance of, of counting degrees of freedom and, and C functions for quantum field theory, but you might ask if they're good for anything, you know, kind of conc more concretely. So the answer is yes, and, and I, I don't have time to do justice to that. Uh, but I would like to just sort of throw out a few of the various things you might, you might be able to do with, with a useful C function. So the first thing is that they uh, unsurprisingly constrain uh, renormalization group flows, right? The, the C theorem says that <coughs> allowed renormalization group flows are not completely arbitrary. They have to satisfy this constraint that C is bigger in the UV than in the IR. So that means that, for example, if you, ha if you have a UV theory uh, and you have a guess for what it does in the infrared, you have to, you know, you have to make sure that that guess passes even the, the rough checks 
that the, the C's theorem imposes. So let me give you a very vague, simple example of how, how you might use that. Let's say you have a gauge theory in four dimensions, a little bit like QCD, with some matter content, a bunch of fermions maybe, in different representations. Let's say you suspect that the theory breaks chiral symmetry in the infrared and there are a bunch of Goldstone bosons. The Goldstone theorem tells you that there are as many Goldstone bosons as broken symmetry, so you have a guess for how, how many Goldstone bosons there are. If it turns out that your guess includes, involves a huge number of Goldstone bosons, they'll contribute a lot to the infrared C function. And then if you compare that to the ultraviolet value of the C function, you might find that you have too many Goldstone bosons. So that means that this proposed symmetry breaking pattern is actually not possible. It's, it's inconsistent with the C theorem. And you can use this kind of logic to rule out all sorts of candidate IR phases for given ultraviolet theories. In three dimensions, you can put limits on the size of topological sectors and, uh, and so forth. Now, a second thing that you can do with C functions is uh, that if you're lucky, there are circumstances in, in which they control uh, the actual density of states of the quantum field theory, at least in some regime. And a classic example of that is what's called Cardi's formula in two-dimensional CFTs, where the high energy density of state is completely determined by the virus central charge. And there are some higher dimensional analogs of that, although they're pretty scarce. And finally, I'm going to come back to this big comment I made about black holes and, and how we might use to, uh, degree of freedom counting in, in quantum field theory to understand something about them. And uh, the comment here is that at least if you're interested in the entropy of certain classes of black holes, uh, it turns out that you can explain that or, or calculate it by counting degrees of freedom in a different but related problem, which is actually a quantum field theory. Um, and so, so you, you, know, you would like to calculate the ent entropy of some black hole and, and you find a, an associated quantum field theory problem where you count degrees of freedom and the answer to that question turns out to be the entropy of the original black hole you started with. Now that sounds like a, uh, a pretty dramatic situation, but there, there are very concrete constructions in string theory where you can find such an associated quantum field theory. And more generically, um, you know, this is kind of uh, quite natural in the, course, in, in the context of holography. Which, which is usually uh, known as the ADS-CFT correspondence, we have a very generic correspondence between gravitational theories and different but, but you know, precisely associated quantum field theories. So at least for the purposes of some questions, uh, uh, counting degrees of freedom in, in quantum field theory can teach you something about black holes. Now everything uh, that I've said is been quite general, and, and I haven't gone into uh, the actual details of how one analyzes C functions and how one tests whether they're really, uh, you know, C functions and do all the things that we think they are. They do. Oops. But um, but the basic uh, problem is that the analyzing candidate C functions in specific examples is is quite challenging, especially if the examples are interacting. Uh, theories, as, as Gary mentioned in the beginning, interacting quantum field theories are still a major challenge to us um, in many ways. And um, supersymmetric quantum field theories have played uh, sort of an important role in the development of this whole subject of C functions because they provide a rich zoo of examples that can be analyzed in great detail. Okay? And uh, I'll say a few words about why that is in just a second, but let me just make two comments for maybe, uh, the more technical audience. There are, there are two developments in supersymmetry that go under the name of A maximization and F maximization, uh, which uh, you can roughly speaking think of as supersymmetric versions of C theorems, at least in four and three dimensions. And these were kind of independent developments in supersymmetry in, over the last 10, 15 years um, that uh, that independently established supersymmetric C theorems um, and uh, in both cases actually predated the, the understanding of the corresponding non-supersymmetric C theorems. So they kind of provided major evidence that, that uh, the objects that people were discussing and the conjectures that people had made actually made sense and, and were on the right track. And just one sentence about why supersymmetry helps. I mean, you've, you've almost certainly heard of supersymmetry as 
a symmetry that relates bosons and fermions and leads to dramatic cancellations in many computations. For example, famously, the quadratic divergence of the Higgs mass in the standard model. That's why it's uh, an attractive candidate for physics beyond the standard model, because it can try to resolve the so-called hierarchy or fine-tuning problem that is associated with this divergence. But the same type of cancellations that make that possible are also responsible for the additional theoretical control that you enjoy if you study these theories. Because roughly speaking, you know, there's a lot of cancellations going on, and, and otherwise very complicated computation uh, can boil down to, to a much simpler subproblem. So this is the very, very rough picture of why supersymmetry helps, even if you're just interested in general quantum field theory questions. OK. Now, uh, we've discussed the C-theorem two dimensions. I've uh, said what the various candidates or, or conjectures are in higher dimensions. And I also said that, uh, that some cases have been proven in the four-dimensional case. So for example, um, the four-dimensional A-theorem uh, has been proven. And I would like to give you a very, very intuitive flavor of what the proof looks like. Um, so we said that um, in even dimensions in general, we, we should be looking at the A-type uh, Weyl anomaly or trace anomaly. Um, that is associated with the trace of the stress tensor in an external gravitational field. But we've also said that studying an operator in the presence of its corresponding source is the same as studying correlation functions of that operator without the source. So that means that the A anomaly sits somewhere in the correlation functions of the stress tensor. And these are, in general, very complicated. But it turns out that in very special limits, they look like scattering amplitudes of a massless scalar particle that, for various historical reasons, is called the diloton. So this is some scalar field phi of x. And so the claim is that by studying scattering of that scalar particle, you can actually learn something about the non-trivial and complicated correlation functions of the stress tensor. And uh, because those know about the A anomaly, it turns out that if you study the right scattering amplitudes, you actually learn something about the quantity delta A which is this change in the A anomaly as you go from the, the UV to the infrared. So this is the quantity that you need to prove is positive in order to establish an A theorem. And the claim is that this is a quantity that shows up in some type of special scattering amplitudes of this diloton particle. So at this point, we're just doing scattering of massless particles. We know what we're doing. And here I've drawn cartoons that, roughly speaking, represent the situation in two space-time dimensions and in four space-time dimensions. In two space-time dimensions, recall that uh, the C function was associated with a two-point function of the stress tensor. And we said that two-point functions have to do with propagation, not with scattering. So if you look at the propagation of the diloton from point x to point y, you get some type of probability amplitude that turns out to be proportional to delta A, which we said in two dimensions was just the change in the Virasoro ch central charge. And um, again, we've already encountered this. Two-point functions in unitary theories are naturally positive because they have a probability interpretation as a norm squared. So just that by, by the virtue of the fact that this two-point function is proportional to delta A or delta C, we get a different proof of Zamologikov's C theorem that, that the C function in 2D decreases under our G flow. So this was just free, well, more or less free propagation. Uh, in four dimensions, the story is a little more interesting because the correct scattering amplitude that you need to look at in order to extract delta A is a four-point function of dilettons. So this is now a four-point <laughs> scattering amplitude of these four scalar <clears throat> particles. So you send them all in, and then you know something happens in, in the middle. They interact. And the claim is that this whole amplitude is proportional to delta A. And uh, it turns out that there's a kind of <clears throat> uh, subtle and interesting uh, positivity associated with this kind of four-point uh, amplitude in four dimensions that essentially comes from the optical theorem. So in special limits, if you, if you fine tune the kinematics of these dilettons and you pick their momenta just right, you actually can prove uh, that this four-point amplitude has to be positive, uh, roughly speaking, uh, because of the optical theorem. And, and the claim is that because that amplitude is proportional to delta A, <coughs> that establishes the 4DA theorem. So 2D. C theorem or A theorem was a two-point function. 4D A theorem was a four-point function. Now we keep going. What happens in 60? 
Well, first we need to go back to the elephant in the room and discuss uh, why the hell we should be discussing quantum field theory in more than four space-time dimensions. I have alluded uh, to this point at various points during the talk. And uh, for example, we might ask whether such theories even exist and, and why, should, should, why should we discuss them. Uh, as far as the first point is concerned, it's, uh, it's a kind of long-standing standard lore that interacting UV-complete quantum field theories do not exist in more than four space-time dimensions. So you know, when you study elementary quantum field theory or, or Landau's theory of statistical phase transitions, you learn that four is the upper critical dimension uh, for interacting uh, field theories. And, uh, and an intuitive way of understanding this that, that kind of is in the spirit of part one of the talk is that if you try to make an interacting continuum theory uh, by starting with a lattice model and adding all sorts of interactions to that lattice model, then as you take the continuum limit, as you take the lattice spacing to zero, all the interactions that you put in by hand will actually wash out and you'll end up with a non-interacting free theory. So it's very hard to make interacting quantum field theories in more than four dimensions. Now, uh, it turns out that kind of constructions in, in non-perturbative string theory starting in the mid-90s uh, very surprisingly provided many examples of precisely such theories that we thought couldn't exist in five and six dimensions. And uh, <coughs> because they arise as the de decoupling limits of, of string theory, they all turn out to be supersymmetric theories. Uh, so we have you know, that, that handle on them. But uh, in many, many ways, they're difficult to describe directly. Uh, you can either try to study them in the full string theory, uh, but, uh, but we don't have a good handle of them as quantum field theories. And, and trying to say something useful about them using field theoretic techniques is an active frontier in the subject. And, and just the fact that these theories are so difficult to analyze should be reason enough to study them. Um, because you know, if our goal in life is to understand more about quantum field theory, uh, then we should try to push uh, you know, our abilities to the point where, where they break down. And uh, in the spirit of this talk, you know, if we were given a new and interesting class of, uh, of quantum field theories, we should try to study RG flows between them and, and look for C theorems. So let's ask about the A theorem in six dimensions. And we already said two dilettantes, four dilettantes. Now in six dimensions, there will be six dilettantes. So proving an A theorem in six dimensions would amount to showing that a very particular six diliton amplitude of this form, uh, which is proportional to delta A in six dimensions, has to be positive. And this is now an even more complicated amplitude than we had before. There's six external particles. We send them all in. Something complicated happens in the middle that I'm not trying to explain to you, represented by this star. And in general, nobody has succeeded in coming up with an argument um, that shows that this six diliton amplitude is always positive. So proving the A theorem in six dimensions is an interesting open problem. And uh, I'm sure that we would learn something quite, quite general and, and, and interesting about quantum field theory if we could prove such a positivity statement. Now, it turns out that uh, supersymmetry helps a lot because what supersymmetry tells you in these theories is that this six point amplitude is actually somewhat special it factorizes into two halves. So roughly speaking, there's a three-point amplitude here. Then there's some type of intermediate particle propagating through here. And then there are three points over here. And this six-point amplitude is roughly speaking the square, the norm squared of these two three-point amplitudes. The limit that you have to take in order to get delta A is such that the intermediate propagating particle basically doesn't play an important role. And you, the amplitude factorizes, and you just get a square of the two sides. So because the six-point amplitude has this special factorized form in supersymmetric theories, uh, the fact that delta A is positive is trivial because it's a perfect square. <coughs> and even though it only applies to supersymmetric theories, just like in lower dimensions, this is strong evidence and strong motivation uh, for the fact that it's probably true more generally, and we should keep looking. So this is pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, just the three or four main points uh, for emphasis. So we said that uh, in quantum field theory, short distance effects render uh, 
overly simple or naive ways of counting degrees of freedom useless. And C functions are useful tools for uh, more precisely quantifying the number of degrees of freedom in those theories. And they make precise the intuition that this number should degrees under renormalization group flows from the UV to the IR. And we've also uh, reviewed a little bit how the known C functions that have been constructed are related to vacuum entanglement and at least in even dimensions to A-type trace anomalies. Uh, and uh, I also explained a little bit how dilaton scattering can be used to establish the A-theorem in four dimensions and at least its supersymmetric cousin in six dimensions. So I'll stop here and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Um, so, okay, so the whole talk is about counting degrees of freedom, right? And, and so we like these C and A functions because they fit our intuition about the degrees of freedom decreasing as you go along the flow. Um, so, but if we wanted to consider the whole space of quantum field theories, let's say, then we would also want to compare, you know, we might have some intuition about two sort of different flows with unique UV fixed points. And, you know, say, you know, okay, does C then fit our intuition that, you know, this theory with this UV fixed point, you know, we might expect to have more degrees of freedom than this other one. Um, so, like I said, been working sort of comparing uh, field theories with along different flows. You know what right, I mean? but are, are you imagining that these field theories that at some point uh, flow to each other or, or maybe join? Maybe not. Maybe they're very far away from each other. Well, it's true that that you, you could use. I mean, even if field theories don't somehow flow into each other, you can try to organize the entire list. Of, if you make right. a list of all field theories, right. you could try to order them according to C. Right. And you might ask if that if, if that teaches you something. Right. Does that does that fit your intuition? Uh, there, I guess. You know, there's some general picture that I think various people have tried to make precise that, that it is indeed useful to think about the whole landscape of field theories this way. Um, it's a little bit hard to make precise yeah. what, what you mean by the space of all field theories if you can't actually flow from one to <coughs> another. Um, but I, I think one of the main messages of this talk is that it's always a good idea to organize uh, everything by scale mm -hmm. and everything by by how many degrees of freedom it has. And the two are, of course, very much related. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.